everyone. My name is James Morris and I am an assistant professor at the University of Tsukuba in Japan and current managing editor for Northeast Asian Studies here at the Digital Orientalist. This year I had the pleasure of attending the summer school in Japanese early modern paleography at the University of Cambridge after being involved in the Tackling Pandemics in Early Modern Japan project which was run in its stead last year and which some of our readers may be familiar with from pieces that I have wrote in relation to that project for the Digital Orientalist. The summer school and the aforementioned project were run in collaboration with a Japanese transcription platform, Mina de Honkoku. Today, I'm overjoyed to be able to show you the first part of two of an interview with the creator of Mina de Honkoku, Professor Hashimoto Yuta, the organizer of the summer school, Dr. Laura Moretti, and Joseph Bills, who taught the summer school's intermediate class this year. The interview was recorded in September 2021. The focus of our interview was on using Mina de Honkoku in the classroom, and therefore it concerns digital humanities in practice. Without further ado, I will allow you to enjoy the interview. So I'd like to begin with some self-introductions, um, starting with uh, uh, Hashimoto Sensei, um, and then with uh, uh, Lauda, uh, Dr. Moretti, and then with uh, Mr. Wills, Joseph. Wonderful. So I will pass it over to you, uh, Yuta. Okay. Uh, thank you, James, uh, for having me here today. Uh, so, well, uh, my name is Yuta Hashimoto. I'm an assistant professor at the National Museum of Japanese History, or Rekihaku, in Chiba Prefecture. Um, my research interest is uh, digital humanities in Japanese studies, um, especially pre-modern Japanese studies. Well, uh, my original background was history, but uh, I have developed uh, several web and mobile apps for research and education in Japanese studies, including Minna de Hankook. Okay, that's all. Wonderful, thank you very much, um, Laura. Thank you, James. Um, so my name is Laura Moretti, or Laura Moretti. I'm a senior lecturer in the cumbersome Cambridge uh, languages, just associate professor in pre-modern Japanese studies at the University of Cambridge. Um, and I work on commercial popular prose uh, in early modern Japan across the 17th, the 18th and the 19th century. Um, and uh, the project I just concluded uh, focused on the beginnings of commercial uh, publishing in 17th century Japan. Um, and I currently am developing two projects, one which I tentatively call uh, around what I tentatively call playful reading and another which is a collaborative one on early modern graphic narratives. But alongside my research and teaching, I every year organize uh, with colleagues uh, uh, the summer school in Japanese, in early modern Japanese paleography. And I would really like to thank James today, uh, Professor Morris, for bringing us together uh, and giving us this wonderful opportunity to reflect upon what we did, how we taught, and what we can learn from uh, the 2021 summer school. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Joseph. Yes, thank you, James. Uh, my name is Joseph Bills. I'm a master's stu student at the University of Cambridge studying uh, under Dr. Moratti. Uh, my main area is late 18th century, early 19th century popular prose, particularly uh, early modern picture books in quotation marks called Gibyoshi and the work of one particular author, Santa Kyolen. Uh, so in the summer school, I was teaching the intermediate section, as uh, James, you so uh, graciously introduced. And I'd like to thank you as well for letting us all, yeah, as Dr. Murray said, have a bit of a reflect on what happened and how it went. Thank you very much. I, I hope it, it, it does become a space for us to reflect on um, the school. Um, right, so the first set of questions are sort of introductory questions, um, or perhaps what I'm expecting is introductory answers, perhaps. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask um, Laura first, if, 
if you could explain um, a little about the summer school and its its history, just to people who are unfamiliar um, uh, with the summer school. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, first, I'd like to say that working on uh, early modern Japan, no matter what the discipline is, really requires the ability to, wide, uh, to read a wide range of cursive scriptures. So we are looking at this kind of materials, these squiggly uh, kind of bits, uh, and uh, there are a, a lot of different styles. Uh, you saw one uh, a few seconds ago, and this is a completely different calligraphic style. So this is really what... Uh, uh, working on early modern Japan entails at the very basic level. When I was a graduate student, many, many years ago now, you can see from the white hairs, um, I had to tackle very much alone the paleographic challenges involved in mastering early modern Japanese cursive writing. And I would not lie, it was not easy. So at the time I promised to myself that in the future, if I could continue uh, with an academic career, I would try my very, very best to support other learners in the study of what is a complex set of skills and therefore to ease their burden. And the summer school in early modern Japanese paleography at Cambridge precisely does this. It trains the new generations in decoding and transcribing early modern manuscripts and woodblock printed texts, trying to make in the process of learning as engaging, uh, effective and enjoyable as possible. Um, the focus is on vernacular Japanese, um, but the program also tries to promote understanding of the multiple written languages that were employed in early modern texts. So we cover to a certain extent Sorobun, which is a form of hybrid uh, literary Chinese used in particular in documents and uh, 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 you know, contracts and so on and so forth, letters. Um, and also to a certain extent, Kanbun Kundoku, which is literally Chinese read as vernacular Japanese. And for Kanbun Kundoku, I've been collaborating over the years uh, with Professor Yamabe Susumu at Nishogaksha University. So the first summer school took place in 2014 at Emmanuel College at Cambridge. And the past August, 2021, we concluded the eighth edition of the summer school. Um, the program attracts mainly graduate students, so MPhil and PhD students from all over the world, uh, with more seasoned scholars, librarians, and museum curators uh, also welcome. So, James, you were the more seasoned scholars uh, in, in our categories. Um, Altogether, to date, we have trained more than 250 researchers on the program. And Personally, I see this as one of the ways in which I, I can try and offer a meaningful contribution to the field of Japanese studies beyond my university teaching and my research. And I also must say that um, uh, this is a fantastic chance for myself uh, to learn from the participants and from their various uh, disciplinary interests. Uh, I really view the summer school as a, a wonderful opportunity to create an ever growing network of likely minded scholars. And last but not least, I would also uh, like to say that we have been gifted with the generous uh, financial support of various institutions over the years. And here I would like to express my wholehearted gratitude, especially to Mitsubishi Corporation. Uh, I think hopefully that will give an idea of the summer school and what we do. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so, for most of those summer schools have been held in person. Um, and then the first uh, project or summer school, which I got involved in was, as I said in the introduction, in 2020. And I imagine it was, I may be wrong, but I, I imagine that the circumstances of the uh, coronavirus pandemic forced the summer school online so to speak and uh, when that happened you decided to um, hold that year's project and the summer school in this past year in collaboration with uh, Mina de Honkoku. Um, so why um, did you choose that tool rather than a competing tool or a 
using a, a different system altogether um, to run the, the summer school. Um, Thank you, yes, James. Thank you. Um, I fear that my answer might be a little bit long, so please do bear with me. I, I beg your pardon for, for the length, but I think we, I would really like to try my very best to give justice to this wonderful tool that is Mina uh, de Honkoku. So the idea to approach Professor Hashimoto and to collaborate with his uh, platform, uh, Mina de Honkoku, was actually there much before the pandemic. Um, when I first discovered Mina de Honkoku in 2016, I believe, when I was invited at an international conference uh, entitled Yomitai Nihon no Kotenseki, which was organized by Professor Ikura Yoichi at Osaka University. Um, I hardly had the courage to uh, approach Professor Hashimoto at that stage. Um, and then the pandemic hit in 2020, and that gave me, in a way, a golden opportunity to take the courage and uh, get in contact with Professor Hashimoto. Uh, and since then, it has been really a wonderful collaboration. So the recent developments in artificial intelligence, AI, and the impact that such developments are likely to have on the study of early modern Japanese cursive uh, cannot be ignored, I think. Um, so the choice of Mina de Honkoku over other platforms um, is informed by a number of elements. And here I would like to highlight six. First, um, Mina de Honkoku is not designed as an optical character recognition tool. It is not OCR. It does not try to read a cursive text in place of the human. Minna de Honkoku incorporates artificial intelligence in a very productive way. Um, the AI function in Minna de Honkoku is there to assist us humans in decoding what is on the page, offering a number of hints, right? Let's say that you're stuck on a character you cannot possibly read. You click on the AI button or AI chan, as we called it uh, during the 2022, uh, 21, uh, sorry, summer school. And the AI lists several hints. From this point of view, the AI function in Minna de Honkoku works like a very powerful, easy to use, very clever dictionary of cursive Japanese. And it is the human then who comb through the hints given by AI and then chooses which hint is the correct one in that specific context. So the choice made by the human is an informed choice. It is informed because the human considers at least two factors beyond the mere shape, the meaning of the text and the grammatical structure of the sentence. Please really allow me to stress this point. Reading early modern Japanese cursive is not simply a matter of shape recognition. It is a matter of grasping the meaning of the text that we are reading. Recognizing and transcribing shapes is part of a complex activity of meaning making. And Mina de Honkoku is really the ideal platform that enables the correct, this correct mode of reading early modern cursive. It asks human to think about the meaning, but assists them with a very powerful dictionary. So I hope that this first point is clear enough. And I think that this is really very important amidst the many developments of OCR platforms uh, and makes Mina de Honkoku stand really apart in a very positive uh, sense from my point of view. Um, second, um, the AI function in Mina de Honkoku uses two separate data sets. And this allows for the hints produced by AI to be cross-checked. And this in turn means that the accuracy is really enhanced. Um, third, Mina de Honkoku is designed in such a way uh, to foster collaborative work. Uh, one participant transcribes, the transcriptions is accessible to all the other participants, and this beautifully designed platform allows the other participants to offer feedback, and then the system keeps a record of all changes at all stages. And this means that the instructor can carefully check the input of each participant even outside of the classroom time. Fourth, uh, Mina de Honkoku encourages the production of what we call diplomatic 
transcriptions, indeed the Honkoku in Minna de Honkoku, um, and to reproduce in contemporary script as faithfully as possible an early modern text remains the form of transcription most cherished in Japanese academia. Fifth, Minna de Honkoku is very easy to use. You do not need to be a computer nerd to enjoy using it. I'm very bad with computers. I enjoy immensely using it. It's easy, intuitive, effective. On top of that is free of charge. Sixth and last, but certainly not least, the developer uh, of Mina de Honkoku, Professor Hashimoto, is simply a joy to work with. Uh, as he will explain later, Mina de Honkoku was not developed as a tool to be used in the classroom or even to be necessarily used outside of Japan, if I might dare to say. Um, so when we started our collaboration, we asked for several tweaks and changes, and Professor Hashimoto has been amazing in accommodating our requests. He's clearly very keen to keep improving this already wonderful platform and to adapt it to new uses. And what is more though, I think he's genuinely eager to understand what we scholars of early modern Japanese texts need. Of course, Professor Hashimoto comes from, to, it, to this from his field, which is digital humanities. But he's willing to recognize that we may come to this platform, his platform from a different angle with different needs. And this open-mindedness, this flexibility, this willingness to listen, I think is something I truly admire in Professor Hashimoto, and it is what have made our collaboration extremely fruitful. So uh, the pandemic um, made me the, gave me the courage to approach Professor Hashimoto, and uh, these are the reasons uh, that made me chose his wonderful platform. Sorry for the length, but I hope it was as, uh, you know, um, comprehensive as possible. It wasn't that lengthy at all. It was a wonderful answer. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I'd like to bring in uh, Joseph now and ask um, how he became involved in the summer school himself. And I guess I'm sort of predicting the answer here. I, I think you were perhaps a student on the summer school originally. But I'd, I'd like to learn, I guess, about the journey from being on the summer school as a student and then to being an, an instructor on the, the summer school. Um, yeah, look, so that. exactly as you said, I started as actually being one of the participants. Dr. Moretti uh, encouraged me to go on it in my second year in 2019, I believe. Um, I can't remember the original reason, to be brutally honest, it will be something to do with very good for research, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, because it's me, probably because I thought it would be a laugh. So that was done in a very kind of classical way, none of the AI tech, anything like that, because there were ruminations of it at the time, but nothing really used in the teaching. So it was all very much paper dictionaries take your kind of like, you know, texts and do it all based off your own experience and kind of uh, well, your kind of instinct and stuff like that. But then the world ended in 2020. And I was, <laughs> I was in Japan at the time and the pandemic forced the uh, summer school online. And as a result, Dr. Marati started the you know, the Honkoku collaboration and I was able to participate in that as well. And I spent a lot of time using the functionality that she mentioned about uh, kind of checking other people's transcriptions. I was doing a lot of it myself, but I was also spending a lot of time actually um, working on other people's and kind of providing comments and checking, cross-checking and all of these kind of things with other ones. So having had that experience, Dr. Matty very kindly approached me and said, do you want to help uh, work on the 2021 summer school to teach the intermediate track of it? And I said, yeah, sure, because it sounded like a very good experience, and indeed it was. And I thought, considering I'd had a lot of experience, you know, commenting on people's work and finding out where they, where kind of common mistakes are found and kind of the very minutiae details of Mina de Honkoku as well, I thought that'd be a very good experience to use working with people who have had more experience actually doing the transcription, but maybe are not quite so used to doing it online or doing kind of perfect diplomatic transcriptions or forcing themselves to learn the meaning as well as just the reading of a text. 
so yeah that's how I ended up kind of teaching the intermediate track wonderful and these are this experience you have using both Mina De Hongkok and some other platforms are things that I'm looking forward to asking you about uh, later in this interview. Thank you. Um, so next, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Hashimoto Sensei. Um, and I have uh, two questions within this introductory section for you. Um, so the first question is, um, so you're the creator of uh, Minade Hongkoku. Um, and as I said in the introduction to this interview, I, I think, I oh know perhaps I didn't mention it, but I think most of our readers are probably familiar with your platform, um, either through um, pieces which have appeared in the Digital Orientalist or just um, through their experience of uh, the digital world, I guess. Um, the, the sort of tools and products that are on offer. Um, so unless I'm mistaken, and I, I think um, Dr. Moretti already mentioned this um, in one of her responses, um, Mina wasn't created primarily with education in mind. So I'm wondering um, how you feel about it being used for this um, perhaps a different purpose than it, than it was created for? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, actually, when I created Minna de Hongkoku, uh, I had education strongly in my mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, to tell the truth. Uh, to explain this, I need to talk about the history of the project. Uh, and I, I apologize in advance, uh, but the, uh, the story is going to be a bit long. Um, well, I had developed and launched the first version of Minna de Hongkoku in 2017 as a, a crowdsourcing project uh, to transcribe large volumes of historical earthquake records. Uh, back then, I was a PhD student uh, of digital humanities at uh, Kyoto University, and I was also a member of an academic group named uh, Kojishin Kenkyukai, or the Historical Earthquake Study Group at the Kyoto University. Um, it is a joint group of scientists and historians who have been working on uh, pre-modern Japanese earthquake records for seismology research and disaster prevention. Um, I joined uh, this group in 2014 uh, because um, I had been interested in historical seismology uh, since I had experienced the Tohoku earthquake in 2011. Um, Minna de Hongkoku uh, started as an attempt to transcribe 500 uh, historical earthquake records uh, stored by the Earthquake Research Institute uh, of University of Tokyo. And um, before the launch of Minna de Hongkoku, uh, almost no one had thought uh, crowdsourcing of Kuzushiji leading uh, would be possible because the task is just too, too difficult for the majority of uh, people. Uh, but after I had participated in the development of Kuzushiji Learning App or Kura at Osaka University in 2015, I started to think differently. Um, well, Kuzushiji Learning App or Kura uh, was a part of an educational project Read by Professor Yoichi Ikura uh, at Osaka University, that uh, whom uh, Moriti Sensei just mentioned, and I participated. I, I participated in this project as a developer, and soon after we launched this app in 2016, uh, it has become quite popular beyond our expectation. Uh, the download count reached at 10,000. Uh, 10,000 within a month after its release. Um, and I think that's a consider considerable number uh, for an uh, app uh, developed by an academic project. And this experience made me realize that, that there are many people uh, in Japanese society uh, who are interested in reading Kuzushiji. And I came up with an idea that uh, we can use education to make the cloud sourcing 
because she reading possible. I mean, uh, to be more specific, uh, my idea was like, uh, if we provide educational content and services for running Kuzushiji uh, as a part of our cloud sourcing plot, uh, system, we can draw uh, the attention of, of a large number of people, uh, promote their long-term participation in a project, and train them to tackle difficult task, tasks. And uh, uh, actually, I wrote a conference paper about this approach in 2018, and it's available uh, in the conference page. So let me show you the URL. Okay, uh, it's, in, it's in the um, chat uh, box. So um, anyhow, for this reason, the initial version of Minna de Hongkoku implemented a variety of features to support the learning of Kuzushiji. Uh, one example was the mutual review system among participants that uh, Dr. Moretti uh, mentioned earlier, uh, which allow users to teach each other how to read Kuzushiji. Uh, and this approach worked pretty well. And our initial goal to transcribe all the 500 documents uh, stored by the Earthquake Research Institute was completed in March 2019. So I created and launched the second version of Minna de Hongkoku in July 2019, uh, whose target of transcription was extended to historical Japanese documents in general, not, not limited to earthquake re uh, records. Uh, and so, as I have told you uh, so far, Minna de Hongkoku was designed in a um, uh, kind of educa educational context. Uh, but what I had in mind uh, originally was education for the general public, not, not education for small groups like the people participating in the Cambridge Summer School. And I am uh, I'm so happy that uh, my system is being used for this purpose. And, but the, at the same time, I came to realize that the, um, my system has a has number of problems and limitations. Uh, for classroom uses. Uh, and I've, learned, I, I've been learning a lot from the feedback that the Cambridge Summer School participants uh, gave me. And I believe uh, this will lead to the improvement of the system in the future. Okay, uh, sorry for <laughs> speaking too long. Uh, okay, that's no, everyone keeps saying my answer's long and it, it doesn't feel long whatsoever. Wonderful. I was at that's a, your answer surprised me slightly. Perhaps I look at um, Mina de Hongkoku slightly differently to other people. Um, I don't know. I, the education, the, the creation of Mina with education in mind was never something which struck me. I'd always just assumed that it was um, created primarily to try and transcribe as many documents as possible was um, my thinking, but um, um, it's really interesting to hear that education was actually a, a central part of its, um, its creation. So I, I wonder, you mentioned um, briefly that um, the education that you had in mind when you were creating MENA was for, for the general public, uh, but now we have, um, the Cambridge Summer School using it, for example. Um, are there other universities also using MENA or is the Cambridge Summer School sort of a, a one-off um, example? And um, if other places, other universities, other courses are using um, MENA de Hongkoku as an educational tool, is mm. this is the origins of that within the pandemic, or is it something which has been happening even before um, the, the pandemic began? Okay, uh, so other than the Cambridge Summer School, uh, only one group is using Minna de Hongkoku uh, in the same way for um, education. Uh, that is uh, Kogakkan, Kogakkan University, which is a private university uh, in Ise, Mie Prefecture. 
uh, this university is one of the one of the only two universities in Japan that offer um, Shinto studies program. So, uh, whose graduates are uh, the certificates to be a kanush. Yeah, and for this reason, the university puts a lot of effort into teaching history, uh, Japanese history and kuzushiji as well. And they started to using Minna de Hongkoku to teach uh, students kuzushiji for, uh, since last year. And uh, yeah, I think there is certainly a demand for a system like Minna de Hongkoku um, among other universities as well. But uh, and the pandemic has increased uh, this demand to a uh, considerable, considerable extent. But it seems that the majority of university teachers in Japan are already overwhelmed by the need to give, <laughs> need to give online lessons. And, and they seem to be too um, tired to start something new uh, <laughs> at this moment. Maybe this situation uh, will change uh, in the near future. Maybe. Uh, many, many university teachers have uh, more time for um, for thinking about their education. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful. Um, so now we're going to move into the the second um, set of questions, which are sort of the the main focus of the interview, which is Mina de Hongkok and teaching. Um, is sort of the general theme of this second section. Um, and so first I'd like to turn back to um, Dr. Moretti and Joseph and um, to just ask um, how Mina was used during the summer school. So um, Dr. Moretti was teaching the beginners um, class and um, Joseph was teaching the intermediate class as we were saying. Um, so, I wondered if you could tell me about the, the, the two separate courses, um, sort of more general, generally, how they were structured and um, what sort of uh, educational methods were used within the two courses. Thank you, James. Um, OK, I'll start with the beginners track. Um, and this year, this year in 2021, I tried to replicate what we would be doing in a non-virtual classroom. Um, highly interactive seminars where the participants work individually, in pairs or in groups to produce accurate transcriptions. So um, each three hour session would have moments when the participants worked on their own in breakout rooms and we were using Zoom for that and moments where we would all work together. As they are in structure I was there to facilitate and deepen the process of active learning. Um, so I would normally join the participants in the breakout rooms, remaining there invisible. <laughs> it was a bit of a spy on, on the breakout rooms groups. Uh, but I would normally make notes of what they were stuck on, what were they debating, and so on and so forth. Then we would go back to the main session altogether, and at that point, my job was to check the transcription with the students, asking them to read aloud and translate in English, a rough translation. If there were mistakes, we would then discuss and amend. And I would also try my best to add uh, several explanations, which could be around the cursive script itself or the grammar or the context, depending on, on the case. So this meant that by the end of the three hour session, we all had a correct understanding of the text that we read, an accurate transcription and the kernel of a translation. Uh, normally, uh, when the summer school is held in Cambridge, we meet for six, seven hours a day. Um, but working remotely and across time zones meant that I had to divide the participants in two groups and repeat the same three hour session twice. And that actually was surprisingly interesting from my point of view, because each group brought different sets of skills to the virtual table and also faced different difficulties. So for me, there were not the same sessions um, and uh, uh, that was very revealing uh, in a way. So that's the, how I run the uh, uh, beginners track. And maybe Joseph can explain more about the intermediate advanced. 
Thank yeah. You. So with the intermediate advanced side, you're obviously working with a very different skill set of the participants because they already know how to transcribe or at least how to read Kazushin Hentagana. So it wasn't set up in the same way as a taught seminar because there's not much more I could do there and teach in terms of physically, here's more content for you. Instead, it was set up as a much more self-driven uh, project with then regular, well, we call them in Cambridge supervisions. So smaller group teaching, three or four or five people in a call at once at most, focused on what they had worked on. So I would break up a text, it would be much harder and much longer than the beginner's texts, give it to all the participants in advance, they would go away, work together, cut, uh, work on their transcription and a rough translation, which is something that wasn't quite so focused on in the beginner's section, and then come to the supervision, come to me with what they had produced, and then we would go over it, talk about it, work out bits that were confusing or bits that didn't really make sense on first kind of read through, work out if that is a context issue or a transcription issue, and then really work in a much more collaborative uh, way uh, in that setting. So as I said, but they were much kind of longer text and expecting a much higher level of kind of completion before you arrive in the class, I suppose, than the beginners were, which is a lot more kind of on the spot. There were a couple of cases where we did some on the spot stuff, but it was really kind of work with your partner, work with other people, focusing on that idea of collaboration and come to me with what you think is the correct answer. And then we'll talk about it, which is what we do in Cambridge at kind of how we teach at the university as well. So we really wanted to replicate that. Um, I don't know if Dr. Morality also wanted to talk about this, but another advantage of being online or something that we focused a lot more on this was also before you started with videos. We created quite a lot of those. Um, so Dr. Matty focused a lot on, once again, the beginners. So teaching the very, very basics, the very basic script through a lot of introductory prep videos. And then I did uh, various other kind of, well, in one case, technical ones with how to use Mine de Honkoku, but also ones about Jibo learning, which I think we'll talk a bit about later. But that was really something that was quite good about being online because it allowed us to kind of create these resources, which we could then use in future, but also allow the participants to then watch them at their own pace, watch them as many times as they would like, then uh, learn, kind of prepare at their own kind of pace and ability level, which I think was quite a good thing uh, to introduce. Although it was a new thing. I don't think either of us had had much experience in video production or editing before, um, but I think it was a good thing that we started doing. Yeah, James, can I just show what uh, by sharing the screen, perhaps? Uh, thank you, uh, Joseph. That's I completely nice. forgot about that <laughs> uh, myself. But um, if you go under our um, uh, web page, uh, which is wakancambridge.com, as easy as that, uh, under learning uh, early modern Japanese cursing, teaching sessions, here we have. Uh, a number of videos that are available to everyone, no password is required. I'm trying to create more, but the idea of these videos is that if you're a total beginner, you don't know how to read any of this, uh, you can kind of start out. Um, and uh, um, Joseph also created a video to prepare how to use Minna de Honkoku, um, which was, uh, though under uh, password protected, because this was for the participants. Um, so uh, yes, we, we tried to create a, a number of options um, even before uh, the summer school. I think that that is part also of working remotely, is how to keep people hooked <laughs> for a long time and never being able to physically meet them, um, which was a little bit, uh, uh, you know, something to think about. Sorry, I'm trying to stop sharing. Yeah, sorry for adding this. Uh, but thank you, uh, Joseph. Thank you very much. No, that, those are, you, Joseph mentioned they were the, the first videos um, you've tried making, but they were very professionally done. I'll make sure I, I link them in um, as well. Um, actually, there was um, there's two things which popped into my my head. Um, so 
on the intermediate course, for Joseph, and I, well, I believe maybe Joseph headed it in, in collaboration with you, the selection of the texts. Oh, yes, um, yes, absolutely. And um, there was a very interesting range of um, texts, some which were, were very easy, so to speak, of actually just reading the characters, but getting the meaning was um, very difficult. And then there were, were texts which were, were much more difficult uh, paleographically, um, which I quite enjoyed this, um, the range of texts that we had on the, the course, I guess, is what I wanted to say. And then there were also people um, who took both courses, like myself, um, I can't speak to why other people um, wanted to take uh, both of the courses, but um, some of us um, did want the, or felt we needed the extra tuition, I guess, um, um, or weren't so confident in our abilities, so <laughs> opted for, for both of the courses, despite being told you can do the intermediate or what have you. And then um, the other thing which... I, I, I haven't asked you to speak about it actually, but I should probably um, uh, mention is the summer school is not just a beginner's course and an intermediate course. I believe there was also a, a Cambon course um, for some people, and there are also additional lectures and um, performances as well. And um, if you want to, to mention a little bit about that it, it might be wonderful yes yeah. thank you yes as I briefly briefly mentioned at the beginning uh, indeed the, the summer schools tries to alert the participants to the fact that there are many it's not only a matter of script it's also a matter of languages written languages and kambun kundoku is certainly a very important aspect of the early modern written language uh, and professor uh, uh, Yamabe Susumu from Nishogaksha uh, Daigaku has collaborating uh, has been collaborating with us for you know since the very beginning actually even before I moved to Cambridge we were working together I think we have been working together for more than 15 years now um, and um, uh, this this year we uh, opted to have one-to-one -one, uh, sessions uh, for those who really needed to learn uh, Kanbun Kundoku and they uh, uh, had these sessions with Professor Yamabe Susumu. And yes, yes, every year we try to get, get speakers to have lectures which are connected in some way or another with the theme of uh, that particular year. Um, and this year, since we were dealing with humor, we also had um, uh, performance, two performances and two workshops with uh, the wonderful master uh, Tatekawa Shinoharu. So yes, we try to make sure that it's not a matter of recognition of shapes only. There is a culture of the book, of the printed book, of the manuscript, and we want people to fully enjoy it. But maybe we can say a little bit more about how we use them in the Honkoku in the class, James? Yes, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, perhaps, again, it, it might prove quite helpful to uh, share my screen and just give you an idea of uh, what we used. Um, so this is uh, what the participant of the summer school would uh, have found. Hashimoto Sensei created for us a server. Within the server, there are projects and the project that we were working on uh, was the Cambridge Summer School 2021. As you can see, there was an intermediate track and a beginner's track. The beginner's track has the same material twice because of uh, what I said before, we divided people in two groups, uh, repeating twice. Um, so Minna de Honkoku um, allow, uh, displays all the text that we were going to work on. As you can see, there is quite a wealth of texts. And uh, then, uh, it allows to see uh, uh, the text on the right. You can move it, you can enlarge it, and then the transcription on the left. And this is A.I. Chan, uh, so uh, we like her very much. Mina de Honkoku allows only one person to input the transcription at a time. So I would allocate an official transcriber for the particular uh, part of the text that we would read. So I will use you, James, because I think uh, you were the first transcriber. Um, and 
we were working uh, in the first uh, session on this particular text here. And as you can see from the input history, James is the one who really inputted uh, the text. Um, having said that, anyone at any stage can use AI. Um, and I think I am, yes, I am signed in. Uh, let's say that I do not know what this is about. AI chan, dozo taskete, help me out here. And there are the two data sets that we mentioned before. And in this case, this one is not really getting it right. Um, but um, this other uh, data set, if memory serves, gets it uh, gets very reliable hints. Uh, so as you can see, uh, James, who was transcribing, uh, probably clicked uh, with his group uh, working in pairs or in group, I don't remember which one it was, uh, clicked on a, a chan and then they started thinking, what is the right character? You can see that the list is very different, right? Uh, so it is down to James and his group to discuss which one is correct and which one is not. Then James input everything together with his group. Um, and uh, uh, once uh, this, uh, you know, individual uh, work was done in the breakout rooms, then we will go back all together and work on, uh, on what was available uh, there. Sorry, I stopped sharing for a, a, a second here. Um, so it really was fascinating for me to see how the participants used the AI function during the pair and the group work. Um, it's really the idea, uh, going back to what I, I answered during my first question, is really that, uh, well, second, but um, it, it's really connected also to why I think Mina de Honkoku is uh, right now the best platform out there. Uh, because if you're, so AI is there to help you. So it, they were stuck on a character, they would or they were unsure about a character, they would go back, check the I function, ask for help, having done that and having had all the hints, then they would go back to the text and brainstorm, discuss what is the meaning, what is, you know, what is this sign doing here in this context, in this grammar, etc. And if the meaning was still unclear, it was really fascinating to see how they would say, no, it doesn't work, let's go back. And they might go back to AI for more hints and then restart the process from zero. And I was really impressed that really this was the mo mode of working on the text. After the session, the transcriber was not off the hook. The transcriber had the duty to polish, go back to Mina de Honkoku, polish, amend the transcription to mirror what we had uh, uh, decided was the correct thing in the session. And then I was also not off the hook because I would go back and check, uh, double check the final product, which normally was uh, flawless. But if there were still some problems, I would then give feedback via Mina de Honkoku. So um, again, if I, if I just share for a second, um, uh, sorry, just share for, hello, for a second, you will see that uh, um, uh, right now they are still working on, on uh, the projects, but we can leave, uh, any of us can leave comments and the comments will appear over here. As you can see here, somebody is now working on this text. That's the beauty also, they can continue working on this text after the summer school. So um, they keep uh, being, um, uh, you know, um, uh, engaged. Uh, now, um, having exchanged views with many participants on this, I know that they all found the AI function extremely helpful in combination with other dictionaries that they would normally use and as part of the meaning making process that I mentioned already. Um, Having said that, part of my job, I think, was also to make sure that the participants were also trained to work without AI. <laughs> because we cannot necessarily access Minna de Honkoku in our daily jobs, right? So 
That is why during the session, I made extensive use of more traditional dictionaries. And I also concluded the summer school with a text that was not uploaded on Mina de Honkoku. And it was really heartening to see that the participants were able to do it. They were able to read with more traditional uh, uh, dictionaries. They still missed AI Chan, um, but they could do it. Um, and this is really the point that I would like us all to keep in mind. AI, from my point of view, is there to help us decode in cursive, but we have a duty to become able to read independently of AI. And I think that Mina de Honkoku is really designed to make this learning experience possible. That's, I think, it on my part. Thank you. But it might be different from Joseph's point of view. Well, no, honestly, I'm not sure there's anything I can add to that. <laughs> the intermediate session worked in a very similar way in that we used Mina de Hongkoku to produce the transcription and then also to check it and to go over it in the class. Um, if I share my screen of it and to show kind of a picture from what we were doing, ours, as I said earlier, was a lot longer, for example, and a lot more complete, but it's the same idea of lots of different people. Well, in this case, actually, because it was so collaborative, I didn't say who would put in, who would input into what section or anything like that. It was entirely up for people to um, decide and to work together on how to do it. So a lot of different changes were made over time, of course. And each group do, uh, worked it out in their own ways. Some people, I think, uh, did transcriptions kind of offline uh, together, and then one person decided to put it all up online. Um, others kind of did it in pieces, split it up with between each other, et cetera, et cetera. That was entirely up for people to decide. Um, but in terms of how we used it was exactly the same. And I found very similar to uh, what Dr. Murata found that um, people were very happy to use it. I mean, at the start, I think there were some people who were more reticent after spending years and years using paper dictionaries to uh, like kind of almost take the plunge and I mean, not really the hit on the pride, but if you get what I mean, to ask for help where usually they would not do so. Um, but over time, more and more people were able and uh, willing to use it and to go through and do exactly what Dr. Marathi said. So that is the end of uh, part one of the interview. And we will continue with the second part um, being uploaded in a few weeks time. Thank you very much for watching this video today. and. I hope you enjoy the second part also. Thank you. Goodbye.